I've spent a lot of time being aggravated about the least significant bits in floating point numbers. Uh, th there's, there's a bit of, well, that's silly. It's just the last few bits. And, and would that it were silly, I'd be happier. Problem is, there are problems that, that arise. And I like knowing that the answers I'm getting or giving are, are accurate. So in pursuing different ways of, to, to get higher precision, I've looked at a number of things. And uh, Julia has been kind enough to come along and make doing a lot of this easier. I'm going to share some of what I have found, maybe. Not going to work. All right. Give me a moment. I have a plan B. There's a theme that runs through everything I'm going to talk about. And well, it's, it's not necessarily um, common, commonplace to, to discuss. I, I think it's at the core of a lot of floating point issues. And with some luck, oh, there we go. All right, so it turns out that if you start with this many bits and you do a bunch of computations and you end up with a result that's the same number of bits, things are, if it's very mathy, things are going to get out of whack a little bit or a lot. If when you go into that computation word team, the first thing you do is make everything twice as wide and you carry out the computation that way, then just before you return, you round it back down to the normative bit width. That solves a lot of problems. And Professor Kahn ha has come across this a few times, but he's not the only one. Uh, he, he, he keeps coming back to this, double the bits. You want to do your arithmetic twice as wide as the wider of your data or the result that you care about. And more recently, people at the Large Hadron Collider have found something similar. They, they do a lot of subtle calculations, and it's easy for things to, to get less, less perfect than they would like them to be. What they found was that in dealing with a, a very large configurational space, there were little areas that were foamy. And in those areas, their float 64 calculations just sort of ran into a bunch of muck. What ended up working was doing, doing it with the float 64s until they found some foam, and then using the uh, twice as significant arithmetic. That resolved the problems for them, uh, similarly with, with the orbits. Uh, and it doesn't take too much time. I'm not going to spend any, uh, any significant time now talking about uh, details that are here. I'll make it available. Because it's really all about what I've learned. And, and those are big picture issues. So you open up Julia, and you ask her to tell you what is the log of 3. And she does. And as far as Julia knows, she has given you the right answer. It turns out that that answer is off by one in the least significant bit. And again, it doesn't seem like such a big deal, but the logarithm of three, that's, that's not a very esoteric thing to want to know. Uh, and, and it is disappointing that you, you, you just don't know with any of the transcendental functions. You don't know which ones are spot on and which aren't. Uh, so there is a way around it. Thanks to go to GitHub, DP Sanders, get yourself CR Live M. It is good. Uh, CR Live M 
does give you correctly rounded results for all of the functions they cover. It's solid. Uh, and the way that we, we have it in Julia, it becomes very easy to use those routines instead. All, all that you need to do is, in a loop, replace the base function with the CR lib n function, and, which is distinguished by having the rounding mode as, a, after the argument. And it goes pretty quickly. The cost, in, when I ran it, was somewhere between one and a half and three times just, just using regular floats. And that's not bad. I mean, that's about as, as good as I would expect it to get. There's another way that you can more, more nearly get what is the essence of the value that you are computing and not get so much of things that are least significant bits or digits that may or may not have meaning. Uh, and that is to round the result a little bit to try to wash away any wavy low order bits. And it turns out, kind of like median rounding, it turns out that doing this little thing works a lot of time. Um, and I have two examples. The first one is, is the, the log three, which we got these two different values and if you didn't know where they came from, very hard to tell which one is right. If you clarify both of them, what you get is clarity. It's the same value. There's no, uh, there's no more worries about is what is being represented something you would want to bet on. I can bet on the fact that through the, least, the lowest digit of one, this is a very fair representation of the value I am attempted to get. Uh, a little more difficult case where the rounding is going in both directions still works. All right, big floats, not, not a lot of fun, right? Um, big floats actually do exactly what they say they are going to do, and they do it assiduously. The problem that people have is that's not exactly what you want it to do uh, a lot of the time. And it's, it's difficult to know where, where the cross purposes fall. They're great if you need big exponents range, and they certainly cover a lot of transcendental functions. Not great if you need to, to do what you're doing very quickly. Uh, and it is hazardous to take values that ought to be the same, like um, I compute stuff in Maple at high precision. I set up Maple to deal with numbers the same way Big Float does. And I put those, I take the numbers, put them into Maple, and some weeks later tend to discover my <laughs> things are, are just a little bit off. And it's not because anything that I did or asked the system to do was, was wrong. There is something which, you know, a little differences in the parser can, can just throw it all off. So when you're mixing and matching extended precision numbers and they're coming from different sources, you just presuppose it, it's going to be a little bit wrong and take the care to find out because often it will be. With, uh, right? Um, there are some good things that you can do if you, if you find yourself having to deal with this. One is take the value by parsing a string that has a lot more significant digits than you ultimately need to use. That's a really good way. Uh, then there are some bad ways, and all of them devolve to Julia uh, precompiling uh, floating point values so that what gets translated into big float is not the idea of the number, it's some uh, devolved float 64-bit pattern. And even there, as you see, you can't count on things that should be the same being the same. Uh, and just, just to, uh, I'm not going to say much about this. If you, if you look hard enough, you can find out what's going on and why. It's just really not worth the effort. 
Um, moving on to error-free transforms, these are, these are great. These are a way, this is exactly what happens. You have, uh, say, two float 64s, and you're doing something, uh, just primitive arithmetic. You're adding them, you're multiplying them. What we're used to seeing happen is you take two of them, and you get back one, right? You, the, the result is one float. Error-free transformations let you get back as many as you put in, and, and every bit is good. And that's pretty neat. Uh, so, in order to add two numbers that are ordered, so the, the magnitude of A is greater than or equal to the magnitude of B, and that just simplifies the, the logic here, um, you do the sum as you would ordinarily, and that gives you what you ordinarily get, which by IEEE rules is correctly rounded. If you take that and subtract from it one of its components, you get not exactly the other component, usually, but you get something very close to it. You get what floating point math organized this way says it ought to be. <laughs> Right? It's, it, it's, it's, the, it's the implicit value that you pass explicitly. And when you take that away from what you have passed in, what you get, the residual amount is exactly the second float 64's worth of significance. And it's just spot on. So returning the sum and the residuum is the, is the same thing that you would get if you did everything at higher precision and broke it up into two float 64s at the end. And it works and it's guaranteed to work. And all of the error-free transformations are guaranteed to work just as well. Uh, uh, you can add them un unordered and it becomes a little more complex, but it, not much. Um, there, are, there are a bunch of these things that, that are available or to become available uh, to use any way you want. There's addition, subtraction, multiplication. There's also square root, hypotenuse, and you can do it with FMA too. So you can take three inputs to fuse, multiply, add, and you will get back three numbers that when you add those three numbers, if you were doing it in higher precision, you would get the, the extra significance from the, from the FMA. Um, I have taken these, which are well-known routines, and I, a few of them I've extended so that Instead of just adding two numbers, you can add three, uh, multiply three numbers, things that may come in handy. All of the software that I'm discussing, I had intended to put up tonight. I thought this was happening tomorrow. So it's not available right now, but will become. Uh, the, the last thing about error-free transformations is many of them become much faster and much cleaner using FMA, and all of my stuff does. Uh, moving on. There's another perspective in the numerical make things come out right community. Compensated calculation is instead of getting uh, to doing something to two things and getting back two, two things that are the result, it's putting in two things, getting that one thing is that's the result, but that one thing is computed as if you had the second part, the lower order part, and use that and round it back to uh, the system. It works very well, and, it, and these algorithms can be extended to the dot product of many things, and, and you're guaranteed that, say, if it's, if it's a five-fold compensation, you're guaranteed that the result that you obtain is as if it had been calculated at five times the significance and rounded back. Unfortunately, there aren't many things that lend themselves to this sort of work, and, there's a, and each one has to be approached differently. What we do have, or what is in the literature, you can add, multiply, one or more, uh, do integer powers, dot products, and corner evaluation of polynomials, which is very handy when you need to know that your polynomial evaluation is veridical uh, to higher than available precision. Right, the, 
The best example, or the most widely known example of that sort of computation is that. And this has been very high, finely honed. And with all that, what happens is the result that comes back, it's not perfect. The error free transformation stuff is perfect. This, it's in those last two bits. Don't know, don't know exactly. Often they're good, but there's no guarantee that they will be, and certainly sometimes they won't be. So for when you move from error-free stuff to compensated stuff, you automatically are picking up fuzz at the end. And it's just that you pick up less of it than if you don't do this. Which, all right, let me, before I get into that, It's difficult to give to a client a report that's based on numbers when you cannot yourself say, the numbers that I'm giving you are, give you the best possible idea of the values that are relevant here. If you, if you give them a number and too many, with too many digits and, and the last digits are essentially meaningless, you're, giving, you're misleading a, a sense of, how well, how finely honed the result is. Uh, if you, if it's a little too high or a little too low off of the ideal reportage, you're, you're still promulgating incor relatively incorrect information. And I think that's a terrible thing. It's entirely prevalent uh, because it's, it's, it's hard to care. And really, until recently, there wasn't a lot to be done about it. My, my example of why this may matter is consider a, a robotic surgical suite and somebody is coming in to have a tumor removed. The tumor is basically round and the machine needs to know what to cut. If you tell it to cut something where there are just all these extra digits, it's going to believe that there's that level of refinement in the definition of the tumor and some cancerous tissue will easily be left behind. On the other hand, if a around it too much and just taking out a chunk of the body that doesn't need to be taken out. So I, I, I think that's the same sort of thing is true for financial stuff. Uh, modeling financial time series, you see quantities coming out of, of very sophisticated <laughs> algorithms, but you know that what went in was fractional, you know, 10, 10 and a half and numbers like that. Uh, there, <laughs> so I, I wouldn't want to be the person advising someone to take this much risk based upon numbers that I didn't know to be correct. And, I, and it gets worse when you don't know in what way they are incorrect. So I, uh, the, the next slide in order is about how do you use Julia to create numerical types that allow you the flexibility to do this sort of thing? And it's a lot, it's, a, it's pretty good now, but there are, there are things, a lot of things that you have to take care to do if you're creating a new numerical type so that when other people want to use it, th there are no gaps. It, 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 that it will truly just work. Uh, the first thing is if you're, <laughs> If you have a constraint on the values, you need to put that in an inner constructor so that it always happens. And if you have a constraint like that and a parameter to your numerical type, it is essential that you copy back the inner constructor outside. Uh, and I don't know that I can really. So what happens here is that and the next part, which is defining explicit co conversions that, you wouldn't, that, that don't seem to be necessary. But it, it just happens to speed things up. And, I, and it's something I stumbled on. Um, but what these are are pattern matching. It all comes from there and there so that you can do it by rote. This part matches up with that part. And you know, the, the float high low matches that part, uh, this the side of it. Any, the, the, they all are of a piece of how the type is defined. Uh, so it could be done 
automatically, but don't rely on that. Make it explicit. It will help others. The, you, you, you want to be able to interrelate floating point values with other, other, of other sorts. And you certainly want to be able to handle other kinds of input that are likely. And Julia makes it very easy to broadly handle anything that calls itself a real. Uh, certainly some of them will expect different treatment, and you would have to make that explicit. This is the first part. The first part is the type part. And these are what you need. These are the tasks that have to be done there. Then you get to the Julia manages stuff part, which I consider the substrate. And here, you, ha you want to be giving your numbers a, a, a hash value because that keeps Julia from dropping things back so far into base that it, it catches um, st stuff that's hard to resolve. Uh, you know, let people know what size it is, allow them to copy it, and absolutely make your own way of showing it to the world because uh, the absence of an explicit show string is the root of a lot of trouble. You get uncomfortable error messages when you do that. Comparison and ordering, figure people here understand that. Uh, there is a little difference between the equals with the equal signs and the is equal, and it's basically the difference between comparison and ordering. Then you get to proto numerics. You still don't have a type that will do any arithmetic at all, but you're getting there. Uh, this stuff, handling sign, uh, the, is it a finite thing, making zeros and ones. When you've done that, as well as the other stuff, now you've got a type that you can start telling the world that, 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 how to make things add. And that's all. That's what you need. It's, it's not a little. It's not a lot. But if you leave any of it out, you will not have as transportable uh, a realization. And I will, if I'm trying it, I'll tell you how these things are used. I, I wrote something to test intervals of any kind. I didn't care what they were. I wrote the code so that it will take your numeric concept, quaternion, anything you want, really anything numerical. And I'll make two points out of it, and I'll do all sort, be able to do all sorts of things with that. And it, and it works brilliantly unless the numeric type that's coming in has omitted one of the things. And, and then I have to try to write for that other person's view what, what this thing should be, and that's not a good solution. Uh, all right, ARB floats. This is the this is where things are at today, and ARB floats are based on ARB, which is a brilliant and very fast uh, interval package. It beats big num hands down, and it's maintaining intervals, not just values, up until about 500 digits. Uh, so the, this is the underlying C package, and I have nothing to do with that. Um, so I'm painting on top of it, and what I'm painting is these intervals are telling me the real value, the, the, the veridical point is somewhere in there. Don't know where, but it's somewhere in there. So just as with the, the little rounding thing where I got disparate trailing digits to converge, in a much more formal and uh, effective manner. I can do that with, with ARBs intervals and, and render for us floating point values of uh, extended precision that always read maximally informative. There's no, there's no extra digits. There's not too few digits. These, the value isn't just a little high or a little low. It's spot on. Uh, OK, uh, this works well. Um, so now I have a package that answers the question I started with. How can I be presenting to others values in, with which I can honestly say, it, yes, this is, this is the, the meaning that has come out of the computation. Art floats do it. Um, I, it, it and I have it 